Hello, my name is Michael Parker and welcome to Antidote. Today we're going to discuss the idea of environment and how it influences the development of an organism, in particular, the human organism. So it makes sense that we start with our very first environment the intrauterine environment, the womb. I'm joined in the studio today by filmmakers Stephen and Kathleen Gyllenhaal. We're going to discuss their new documentary, In Utero. Welcome, you guys. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Thank you for taking time out to join us. I watched the film two nights ago. I watched it with my wife, and it was fascinating. And it, it, it's poignant. It, it, it asks some very big questions, which on this show, as I told you before, are my favorite questions and the whole reason for this show. Now, there's some terms and some words in the film that not a lot of people may be initially aware of, so we're going to address that. But let's start off with this, this word, what is epigenetics? Uh, well, epigenetics is a, a relatively new field, meaning it's been around for several decades, but it's only beginning, I think, to come into the mainstream. And what it is, is epi means on top of. So if you think of on top of your genes, there are these, um, they call methyl groups, which are just uh, a collection of molecules um, that attach to your genes. And they can switch on or off, meaning express or not express the gene that it sits on. So where do these methyl groups come from? Why do they come where, you know, and that is what they are now exploring. And it's very exciting research because, say, a methyl group could come from uh, the environment. So a reaction that you have to your environment causes this um, uh, epigenetic expression. So it's no longer something that you're just born with, your genes. It's what then happens in your lifetime, either in your prenatal time or afterwards, that um, can alter the expression of those genes. So epigenetics is all about how the environment plus your genes creates something else. So that one of the things the film explores is if you are uh, a fetus, a developing baby, and your mother is in, for instance, a concentration camp, what happens is the mother's physiology and, and psychology is dealing with an, an environment of suffering, of very little food, of want. And that goes into, the, goes into the mother's body because every emotion that you have has a chemical correlate, everything. So those chemicals then go into the fetus, and they've discovered through epigenetics that the, the, the baby is then shifts development to be prepared to live in a concentration camp when he or she emerges. Now, that has all different implications down the line, which we can talk about. But this is an astonishing discovery. So, so in other words, Darwin said it would take many generations for evolution to shift. What epigenetics is proving is that it can happen in one generation if it's going on in utero. This has, you know, as I said, implications for someone who's dealt with the world of want, but it has implications for all of us. There is a fascinating story in the film. Uh, the expert, I believe, is G Gabor Mate? Gabor Mate. Okay, and he tells this story. Well, actually, I'd like for you guys to tell it, which goes back to your stories of um, the, the children of the Holocaust. Tell, tell us what he said. Well, um, he, Gabor was uh, born, he was conceived during or right before the occupation of Hungary. Well, he, he was conceived during World War II. He was born as the Germans were invading um, Hungary. And, and then and they invaded it, and then they brought Nazism completely to Hungary. And, and um, Gabor's mother uh, called the doctor and said, Gabor, who's just a you know, newborn, is crying all the time. What do I do? And he said, well, I can come, but um, I have to tell you that all the Jewish babies are crying right now. So what he was feeling was his, and he talks, I'm almost quoting the movie, um, was his mother's pain, his mother's fear and even the fear that she had while carrying him, knowing, you know, during the war. Um, uh, and that's, it was coming out as crying and stress and fear in the infant. Now, one of the things that, that you have worked on, Kathleen has worked on in the movie is, these are emotions, these are ephemeral. 
these can be interpreted in many, many ways. What we have to rely on is science as much as we can to, to put all of these discoveries on solid ground. So we're not moving forward in false ways. So the film is very much about, okay, these babies are crying, but let's look at the molecular issues around all of this and, and begin to try and understand why this is happening and apply it to our lives now. Their body in, in the womb was created ready to withstand potential hard trauma. Let's roll back a little bit because in the beginning of the film, there's several ideas that are expressed which are frankly really shocking and troubling. And one of the first ones was this idea that doctors would tell families, you know what, we need to operate on the infant. However, you know what, we're not going to use anesthetic because to use anesthetic would harm the infant. And they would kind of rationalize that by saying, well, look, the central nervous system, you know, is either not fully developed or, well, they're just not going to remember that. That is incomprehensible to me. And, and I was looking just the other day, we were looking into this in a, as early as the, um, or as recently as the 80s, I think that was still persisting. And I think that it has a lot to do with, like you mentioned, oh, the baby's not gonna feel this or, rem or remember feeling this. Um, there's just a lack of understanding that the brain is actually much more developed than we ever thought, not only with a newborn or an infant, but with uh, a fetus. So, um, so that, f that baby is going to feel pain. And, and then we were talking earlier about the un on the unconscious level, um, they're going to remember that pain. So you may not, it may be true that the baby wouldn't remember that particular pain years later, because I certainly don't remember injuries that happened to me when I was very young. But on an unconscious level, the body will remember that. And that can manifest in behavior in um, later life. I want to just come to the word unconscious, which is a dicey word. Because all unconscious really is, is that which we are not conscious of. Now, we're not conscious of digesting food. We're not conscious of our lungs breathing. It's happening. It's keeping our life going. The unconscious issues, the issues that are the unconscious memories that we don't have access to, for many reasons, because we've got to live in the real world, mm -hmm. um, are driving us in many, many ways. So what's very clear, again using science, is that these memories of trauma are, 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 are in, chemically in the body. They're, they remain in the body. So for instance, when one cuts oneself, you don't, and it heals, you don't remember that you were cut, you don't even feel it. But that cut, if it's serious enough, has an effect on how you move in the world. You know, it, it, if, if the muscle's cut and it's not really put back in proper order, and most of them aren't, you begin to carry that little bit of issue th through your body, and that's true consciously, too. And that's true of uh, neurons as well. Um, so um, there's, a, there's a statistic in the film that I believe the man said 50,000 neurons per second are being developed in, in, yeah. in the infant? Yeah. Thomas Vernon yeah, says that. Yeah. That's a, in the that's fetus. A, that's a, in the fetus. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. Because it's such a rapid stage of growth. Um, now I was going to say that back to epigenetics, um, more specifically behavioral epigenetics, that focuses on neurons, so the brain cells. Um, so when you have um, epigenetic changes in brain cells, then obviously you see how that can affect behavior. So that, that sub set of epigenetics, behavioral epigenetics, is really, really fascinating. You know what, let's take a break for a second because I want to show uh, the trailer to the film to get everybody to kind of see, not only is this an informative film, but it's a really beautiful film. So if we could roll that. Intrauterine life is not a paradise as some people try to make us believe. This substance feels every little feeling that the mother feels. This is something that we're just beginning to explore gene by gene. Human beings are affected by the environment as soon as they have an environment. And that means as soon as we're implanted in the womb. I was thinking to myself, just breathe, just breathe, just breathe. Fetuses of mothers who were high anxious showing differences almost, we want to say, in temperament. 
We see reduced brain volume, reduced gray matter density. People are conceiving, carrying, and birthing children under increasingly stressed conditions. My grandmother had undiagnosed depression, which then contributed to my mother's stress level as well. And how that got transmitted to me, and how I was gonna transmit that to the next generation. When we see dysfunction in people, we're actually seeing the imprint of that early experience. An adult trauma is really a fetal trauma. And this has been the missing piece, the foundation for our whole life. When you come to a point of knowing what is the cause of all this, you have an answer, like the door opens. You were watching the trailer for In Utero. Towards the end of today's show, we're going to tell you when the, the film will be out to the public. There's quite a few uh, showings that have happened already and continuing through this year, but we'll return to that in a moment. You begin the film by showing us you know, the fetus in the womb, in the intrauterine watery environment, and you have sound effects, and the child is reacting to things like sirens or perhaps the, the parents having a verbal altercation. I guess one of the first things I wanna know is what type of science do we have that says clearly that the fetus is hearing or experiencing external data stimuli? Well, there's been a lot of research on sound, um, and I think we all know, or a lot of us know about the benefits of listening to classical music, and actually Thomas Verney is in our film said that he thinks people took that and ran with it a little too much, you know, but, um, because that's not the only thing, sure. obviously, that, that'll help. Um, and these studies, I would have to say, were in the latter half, maybe the third trimester, um, when they could actually measure the response. And I think, you know, some of the tests they did was uh, included, you know, would, you know, what was the reaction of the fetus um, to hearing the sound of his mother or her mother's voice, you know, and and they they could measure um, by the fetus calming down, you know, the heart rate calming. Um, they also did a study where right after birth, without the mother having had any further influence after the birth, um, if the fetus recognized her voice mm -hmm. more than someone else's, and they could measure that somehow, you know, if they, you know, went to that voice. So, um, so we do know that, that and, and water echoes. I mean, there's just, it's an amplifier. So, uh, you know, the, the fetus actually grows up in an environment that's very, very loud. And that's why when you have a newborn who's maybe fussy and not going to sleep, people will vacuum or turn on a hair dryer because that it, it mimics the sounds uh, that occur in the womb. And that'll help the child go to sleep. It'll be calming. I think one of the things that the film does, because we kind of walked into this only half knowing what we were doing, we discovered that much of the research that's going on in the world is going on separate. And we've begun to bring these people together. And we're, we're learning more and more about, uh, about the research that's going on. But there is research, and I don't remember the exact details of this, that go back much earlier than the last trimester. And they're doing research on uh, and, 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 and experiments um, with these young uh, babies that they are clearly hearing things, they're clearly mm -hmm. responding things at a very, very early stage. So that if there is, and, and I think also, don't forget that whatever the mother hears and has an emotional response to, the chemicals that she's experiencing go right to the placenta. So whether the baby is hearing, and probably is, he or she is hearing mm -hmm. it, they are getting the emotional response. The same chemicals are in them. So when you start talking about stress on a mother, when you start talking about a war that a mother is going through or any kind of trauma or something wonderful going on, if something wonderful is going on, the chemicals from that, and there are chemicals that are, do, that are, that are involved with that, they go to the child as well and they can see and they've done more and more research on this. And we're still trying to gather that data for, 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 for all people who are pregnant, all parents, to begin to use it. That when you, when you live in a calmer environment, the child develops better. We know that when they come out in the world, it's true in utero as well. And, you know, back to the classical music and Mozart, you know, um, idea, 
it's also a mother singing to the fetus, mm -hmm. a mother talking reassuringly and calmly to the, the fetus. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and those are all ways that, that because the, it calms the mother. I mean, a lot of it is, well, I listen to Mozart, I feel calm. Certainly. So, of course, that's going to transmit. Well, the reason I ask is another really interesting point that's brought up in the film to me is that the fetus does not have language. So the, the fetus does not have words. It also does not have a mental, visual database, all of these things that we use to create logic and to express ideas. And one of the experts in the film says that, you know, this is a feeling organism, mm. not a thinking organism, yet it's a type of thinking and it gets back again to the unconscious. You know, one of the things that is astonishing um, that is not in the film, um, it was just too complicated to really bring into the film, was one of the experts who's, who's involved with doing MRIs on the, on the brain and the development of the fetal brain, that you would think that the, the part of the brain that would develop first would be the reptile brain. It would work in a very you know, clear narrative. You start at the basic and you, not mechanical true, mechanical functions. functions. Yeah. It's not what develops first. What develops first is the thinking Feeling, part. Feeling, emotional. The, the most sophisticated part of the brain is developing first, which was a shock. Okay. Now that was an issue that we didn't really bring up in the film because it was just too much to try and address. But it's, it's speaking to a, a being that is much more complex than we thought it was. And so what does that mean? We don't know yet. This is why much more research has to happen. Because it affects every single human being that's going to come into the planet. You know, the next generation is totally dependent on this u in uterine time. You know, and we haven't taken it seriously, which is why we're so passionate about this subject. Why do you think it hasn't been taken seriously up mm -hmm. till this point? Do you think it's just, it was easier to not have to deal with that so that we could deal with other things? Or was there a taboo or a stigma? Or what is the reason that we diminished its importance, the prenatal development into the development of the That's human? A very big question. Well, when I grew up, a long time ago. The phrase was to be seen and not heard. Sure. Also, when I grew up, I knew nothing about this because I grew up in, in, a, in a certain kind of environment. Freud was, 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 was now beginning to affect the United States. Mm -hmm. And he didn't look at anything before five years old. He assumed nothing really mattered before that. So the science of the time simply didn't think the children were anything other than tiny little adults who couldn't do anything correctly and they had to be disciplined. And it wasn't until, again, science began to look at this. And it was really after World War II when they really began to look at what's going, they began to push it after, after five years, they began to go to Klein and a couple other people began to really look at earlier developmental issues. Erickson was very important in all of this, looking at early childhood development. They began to see, oh my God, it's much more complicated than we thought. Then another major thing happened, and that was ultrasound. And for the first time, you could see, the, the, the doctors could emotionally see, and then the mothers and then the parents could see that there was something going on in there. Mm -hmm. And now we have MRIs that are doing it, so we really are experiencing and seeing it. That was critical to this whole process. That's really, you're talking about the more you just look at, the more you allow yourself to connect with that developing being, then of course you're going to learn more about it and you're going to see all these things. And it's been a slow, um, gradual change towards that. And then another part of your question was, why has it taken so long? Change is very difficult. I mean, change, just think about something in your own life, something simple like I'm going to stop eating this or that or I'm going to, you know, change my regimen or, and it's very, sometimes very difficult to do. So when you, when you start to open up this Pandora's box, that means we have to look at everything right. so differently. And that's almost, you get exhausted thinking about that. We have to rethink how we do everything. And it'd be much easier to just, you know, stay in the status quo and where things are, because then you don't have to shift on so many levels. And what happens when you say to a mother and a father, you have a hyperactive child, he's misbehaving in school, it really goes back to what you didn't do properly when you were pregnant and you're never gonna get that time back again. How do you talk to a mother about that? How do, they, how do they emotionally handle it? Well, denial is a very useful thing in all this, and it's very brave for the, for the mothers 
who go, yeah, I think there's something that wasn't right, and I'm going to do it differently the next time around. And my mother wasn't right, and my grandmother wasn't right. And you have to go, and there's a, an element in the movie where you go, you, uh, one of the midwives who talks to the movie says, you do the best you can. With what you know. With what you know. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think one of the very important things here, maybe the most important thing, is that this is not about mother bashing. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. And you've talked about that. Kathleen's really talked about if the film can begin to show how important it is to respect the mother, to nurture the mother in this process, to empower the mother, that the mother is empowered in this process, that's going to help the child. Absolutely. I mean, when you were saying earlier, like, the mother wasn't right or grandmother wasn't right, I, I know what you meant, but, you know, get, get the word right out of there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the mother did not have the access or the, you know, to that knowledge, and we're trying to bring all that knowledge. Well, let me just say this. As a viewer, I did not take that away from it. I, um, it, it did make me think about my wife and I when we were pregnant twice and, and, and my wife, you know, I mean, she was very healthy. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't get that feeling. But let me jump back just a second. Um, the two of you got married in 2011 and you wanted to have a child. Uh, you have grown children, uh, Jake and Maggie, the great actors. You guys wanted to have a child, but you also wanted to make this movie. Which came first, the decision to have a child or, or the idea for the film? I believe the, the decision to have a child um, was a gradual process, mm -hmm. um, and and then you know, and I'm going to be open about this. We tr we had trouble, a couple of years trying to have a mm -hmm. baby, and we had two miscarriages. Mm -hmm. Something nobody talks about until it happens to you, and then you find out all your girlfriends you know went through something like that. Um, another documentary that needs to be made because it's a silent suffering. And I think during that difficult time, you know, I wanted to understand what was going wrong, mm -hmm. you know, or what, you know, potentially was going wrong. Um, and it's just something I do, too. I want to read. I want to learn as much as I can about something I'm going to be delving into. I knew it was such a big responsibility. And also, um, I guess there was some, as hard as some of the information was to digest, I have to feel like I have to investigate it, like you were talking about Scorpios. We're both yeah. Scorpios. I need to understand how this works, what's going on, especially because we were having problems. Sure. And then the third time around, um, it worked. You know, it, it was a, uh, you know, the implantation, and we didn't do IVF or anything. Um, we didn't have to, but the third pregnancy went to term. And now you have your son, Luke. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this film took three and a half years. Mm -hmm. So you start the film, then you become pregnant, and you have your son. And now the film ends. It's, a, it's going to go out to the public this year. So now we have to get to another heavy question. Right. So as a viewer of this film, as you begin to ponder the implications of this information, one has to ask, and now we ask. So is this a pro-life film? Are you pro-life? We are pro-choice. Okay. Absolutely pro-choice. Um, uh, I knew this would come up, and we're, we're delighted to, to answer this question, because it's clearly walking, the movie walks into this territory. Sure. We address it in the film yes. briefly, um, and I think Stephen and I both feel that this film brings us beyond that debate mm -hmm. into some into a new paradigm, into a new territory. Because what the film is really doing is trying to, br you know, bring forth the, the information that's coming out. That's and and with armed with that knowledge, uh, we need to move forward as a society. And both sides of the debate have good points. Mm -hmm. Life is precious. But it's not only precious just at birth, it's precious all the way through its life. Yes. So what is the quality of that life going to be? And that's where the pro-choice aspect comes in. Another thing I wanted to say as I was thinking about this upcoming interview is when I was pregnant, I had many talks with my OB and other doctors, and they said, do you realize we don't have accurate statistics on miscarriages because so many chemical pregnancies, which means the ones that, that maybe you mistake as a period or a heavier period than usual, you know, it, it was so early on, 
it is a miscarriage, but you don't count it as one. We haven't measured all those. So I could, I could have been pregnant earlier in my life. Mm -hmm. And if that had happened in my 20s, um, I, I would have been very glad that I had the opportunity to choose. You know, I mean, I, I can't say exactly what would have happened, but boy, I, I can say that I wouldn't have been ready at that point in my life. I understand. And mm -hmm. as we were talking earlier, I mean, there is no right or wrong answer. I just, I had to ask because oh, yeah, yeah. This, this film, the information is so powerful. And I think it will resonate with a lot of people. They'll go, well, well, that just makes sense. I mean, yes, there is some big ideas. Some of the information may be jarring, but it makes sense. Speaking of jarring, you know, there, just say go ahead. Thing about it. Um, I think we are pro-choice, which means we have great respect for the people who choose, who, who are pro-life. I mean, I think the film, um, as progressives, we affirm a tremendous amount of what the pro-life people are talking about. And we have some discomfort with our own, our own you know, political um, peer is an, who we agree with. I mean, I think that they're, they're, that what needs to happen, and I've talked with a couple of very political friends saying, where do we stand? What, what do we do about this movie? Because it's addressing a very complicated issue. And they said, this film, two people said, this is film brings us into the next paradigm. It's really the next paradigm beyond where we now stand, which is a kind of civil war with this country about how to do this. And I think that the idea that the truth sets you free is a very critical aspect of this. It's hard, some of this truth, but the truth sets you free. And one of the, I mean, I think that, so I think that where the film really will work, where we will focus on it, and I want to mention one other thing, is that we are starting to design a television show that is, this sort of becomes a pilot for, sort of, a reality television show about pregnant women to keep moving this information on, that we want to have this dialogue out in the open where we can all, and we're gonna, we want very much to speak to the pro-life people, we want to very much speak to the pro-choice people, because I think the film addresses issues for both of them, and hopefully we can come together in a way as time goes on. It is a very important film, and you make a interesting creative choice in the film, which gets back to this discussion about the unconscious and expressing the need to express the feelings of trauma or whatever it was that the fetus underwent within that first environment. And you say that in the past, it was expressed in fairy tales. And now those would be movies. So, and I don't want to give away the whole film because you should go see it, but you use this device in the film in which you show excerpts of particular uh, Disney cartoons, um, you reference superhero films at one point, you use The Matrix. So that was an interesting creative device. How did that come about? Well, Ludwig Janus, um, who is a psychoanalyst um, and MD in um, Hamburg, I believe, he has written an amazing book called Echoes from the Womb. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's sort of almost like a, a Joseph Campbell approach. <laughs> That's what I thought of. Yeah, to, uh, to prenatal psychology. Sure. So he's looking at myths and fairy tales across cultures, and he found um, a common preoccupation with the, our time in utero. So womb-like imagery and uh, birth stories um, or themes in all of these uh, different tales. And so he was the first interview. He was very early on in our shooting, and he brought up um, the fairy tales and... Um, and that sparked something in me as I was designing my questions, um, because as a filmmaker, you want to work with as much visual material mm -hmm. as you can. Mm -hmm. And the idea that this resonates in popular culture is so powerful. So uh, I started asking almost everyone I interviewed, is, have you thought of something in the popular cultural landscape, in films, TVs, music, you know, that, that your research resonates with? And then about half the time, I would get a response. And then you just greedily gather all that up <laughs> and see what you can do with it, you know, because it just really kind of visually gets the ideas across. And as, as much as this is a film that, that is driven by the intellect and data and science, it's a film. Mm 
Yes. And when you are talking about the power that a mother has over a, a, a developing baby, a fetus, when you're dealing with that and you have images of a very big mother and a little tiny person, you unconsciously begin to give an audience a, a sense, even though they may disagree with it, the, they go, this isn't working, I don't buy this, but you're feeding them images that help with the basic ideas. And when you cut that together, I went, oh, wow, that's working on, a, on the level that film really works on. Because yes. this is really ultimately a piece of cinema. I mean, Kathleen really worked hard to turn it into cinema, which it is. Because we have so many experts, there are a lot of talking heads. And you know, this gives it more, you know, we felt that we needed more to give the film that momentum and that cinematic dimension. Well, it's relevant. And I believe I read somewhere that you've done work within the study of dreams as well. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of that. So, I mean, this all makes sense to me. And this idea of giving expression to that which cannot be said because it is prior to birth, yet we carry it with us through the duration of our life. Wow. Well, what's interesting in the world of psychology and the struggle with mental illness and, and what we do struggle with in this country is that for a long stretch of time, I think appropriately people went, you know, analysis and Freudian therapy and blah, 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 all that stuff wasn't working. And let's now use medication. Now let's just look at the body and make the body, you know, it's all about the body. And, you know, and that's an important aspect of it all. But it's been being proven increasingly it's not really working. That, and particularly when you go, okay, here we have a child who is hyperactive or schizophrenic or bipolar or any of these kinds of things. And we're seeing chemical interactions. We're, we're confirming that. But if those illnesses are coming from trauma that was either in uterine or you know, perinatal or pro, you know, prenatal, if it was in that area, then by just addressing the chemical, we're not really solving the problem. The problem is still human. This is really human problems. These are human beings responding to issues. So then you've got to go to the unconscious, you've got to get to that memory somehow and begin to address it from that position. And I think because the, the chemistry, you know, living life by chemistry hasn't really worked very well, and there's more and more evidence of that, people are returning to the idea that maybe we need to look at a more human approach to the trauma and the problems that people are going through. That makes sense to me. And I can see the crews kind of giving me the nods. We're gonna to have to wrap this up. But one thing that I've noticed about your work in particular, and both of you are gifted filmmakers and writers and producers and directors. One thing that intrigued me in particular about you is it seems like, and maybe I'm projecting onto this, but I felt like your content, your what you were interested in is the human form and the human body and our perception of ourselves. Am I, because you, you have this film Beauty Mark, which is about Americans' obsession with beauty. You have a film about sex trafficking, which is called Sita, a girl from Jambu. Am I projecting here or? I think, no, I mean, it's, it's wonderful to take a minute to think about what, you know, about the, the work I've done and what are the common themes. And I would say, you know, there, there are a lot of uh, people have pointed out, you know, that I focus on women and children. Um, and obviously that's something very important to me. But I think it's also about connection, people's connection to each other. I did a short film. I'm from Hawaii. Mm -hmm. I did a short film called Lychee Thieves, which is about a, you know, a diverse group of, because Hawaii is very diverse, so multicultural ensemble uh, cast. And these characters are all fighting over the same thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so in that piece is really all about how they connect and yet how they uh, come into conflict. And the result of the conflict means we all lose out. You know, um, and what they're all trying to get is destroyed. And that's the land in this case in Hawaii. Um, so I think I'm really interested in how our connection or lack of connection, when we become dehumanized, as in the sex trafficking film, then who suffers the most are children, in this case, with the film I did in Nepal, and they are our future. Yes. So then you destroy that, we're all screwed. So I think, it, I think I'd say human form, yes, and human you know, relationship, connection, I think is what 
I do. Matters. And one other thing you're leaving out is, is she's a, a, a producer and a director and a documentarian, but she's also now gotten very involved with, with writing and developing things within the mainstream, more within the mainstream. Um, and they're all the same kind of thing. I mean, they're, they're all exploring connection and disconnection. Mm -hmm. And, and the implications of that, for instance, with the television series, you can really follow that. Um, so she's kind of moving into the narrative world and exploring all that. And I'm sort of going, I want to create this, this reality television show that looks at the same thing from a real place of pregnant women and what's it like and the, you know, what happens when the children grow up and all that. But it's all about connection and disconnection. And it's all about that. Um, because, and, and sometimes we'll have conversations, we'll just be like, it's hopeless. I mean, you look at the world, and oh, I'll say that. I say that. I'll go, it's hopeless. I, I know. And, yeah, and then he'll, and he's always more like, no, it's not, we can do something about it, you know. And 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 all of these stories we're interested in telling have to do with showing how when this gets disrupted, when when you lose connection here or make that choice or this choice, there is a consequence, and it and it affects everything. Ladies and gentlemen. I, that, I, I've got to stop right here because that is almost exactly what this show is about. And it's, I do as well become overwhelmed at times with a feeling of just sheer, like, you got to be kidding me, man. It's like we are not going anywhere from here. But then the other side of me pops up, and that's what this show is about. Stephen, Kathleen, thank you so much for joining me. I love the film. I, I love the vibe that you both have. You're so engaged. And to our audience, I thank you as well because... Without you, there'd be no reason to do the show. If you dig what we're doing here, share it with your friends and family and let us hear in the comments below because this topic that we address today, I know there's gonna be a lot of people with a lot of different feelings and we would love to hear what you have to say. You, me, every single one of us, we are the antidote.